Hey folks, David Stewart here. Hope you guys are having a fantastic day. Sorry about the silence. Usually there's a couple of minutes of music, but I forgot to turn the desktop audio stream back on. So, um, yeah, here we go. We're going to talk a little bit about publishing, publishing a book today. And it's actually a super complex topic um, that... I could go on for a long time about. I'm going to talk about um, a couple of the main ways that you can publish a book. Ways that I would maybe recommend and ways that I probably wouldn't recommend. I'm going to focus primarily on regular novels. Okay, <clears throat> Publishing a graphic novel or a comic book, that's going to be something a little bit different than what I'm going to talk about in this video. So in this video, in this stream, um, I'm really going to talk about and hopefully answer questions if anyone has questions about this kind of stuff on uh, how to publish a regular novel and what that actually looks like for an author. So we'll talk about the traditional method and we'll talk about um, what tends to be called self-publishing, which is well, we'll get into it. Okay, so let's start with um, what is what does it mean to publish anything? Well, it means to make it public, hence the word publish. So to publish is to make public. So there's many, many ways that you can make something public. You can put it on a website. You can print it off of your printer and give it to people. You can um, have a third party print it out and give it to people. You can have a third party sell electronic copies of it. You can do all of these things at once. Um, there are many ways to publish, to make public um, a work of art, whether it's a book or anything else. I'm gonna mainly focus on the two big avenues that most authors are gonna wanna pursue, which is what people usually call traditional publishing, which is where you all the publishing details are handled by a company called a publisher, and you basically are working for them at that point, versus what is usually called self-publishing. And it's kind of hairy to call it self-publishing. And the main reason that I think it's a little bit hairy to call it self-publishing is just that, um, as you'll find out when you get into it, a lot of the things you're not doing yourself. <laughs> you're doing a lot of things yourself. Uh, you're financing it yourself, but you aren't necessarily doing the things yourself. Let's start with traditional publishing. So this is what most people think of with publishing. They're like, I'm going to quote, get published. They put it in that nice little passive thing. Like it's gonna happen. Like somebody is going to publish you. You know, I'm going to get published. It's kind of like, I'm gonna, get laid, right? I'm going to get fired, right? I'm going to get something to happen to me. That's traditional publishing. So what is traditional publishing is where you have a publisher who um, prints and distributes your book or more likely now hires a third party, a printer to print and distribute your book. So I'm trying to get this camera angle just right. So if it's a little awkward, I apologize. This is a live stream. So I'm not trying to do it perfectly here, but I'm just trying to get you know, all the info, uh, all the info kind of there. Um, so yes, you will have a publisher who does it. How do you get a publisher to publish your book for you? And what does that mean financially? So the method by which you will get a book published with a traditional publisher is through an agent. If there's not an agent involved, chances are you're doing one of two things. Either you're writing um, an academic work and publishing through an academic press, uh, in which case you should probably know that you're like, you have a PhD in something and are publishing something related to your to your uh, area of expertise, maybe, uh, in which case you don't need to worry. Or you're having somebody try to scam you into saying, well, we just, we don't do agents. Every major publisher, every traditional publisher uses an intermediary called an agent. Um, what the agent does, this is just how the industry works. The agent talks to the publisher for you and then takes a cut of your royalties. <laughs> That's what the agent does. It's kind of like that middleman guy from office space. I'm a people person. So what the agent really does is they make their money by filtering what manuscripts will get into the hands of publishers. How do you become an agent? 
I don't know exactly except all the agents that I know kind of fell into being agents basically by knowing publishers, right? Um, it's like it's a connections thing, right? You're not you can't jump in and be like, I'd like to be an agent. I can't help you with that. Um, how do you find an agent? Well, good luck before I even begin this, but the way that you find an agent is you write query agent, a query letter, query let qu uh, query letters to people who are book agents. You can figure out who a book agent is often by looking at a book that um, is published, right? So often an author will think their agent or the agent will be listed in there somewhere or you can Google who somebody's agent was and then you write them a query letter. <clears throat> I'm not gonna get in the format for the query letter. Um, you can just Google different query letter formats if you want, but usually there's an introduction, I'm this person and a quick tag with your introduction of who you are and what maybe you've done before. Like, you know, if I were to write one, I'd be like, I'm David Stewart. I'm a, uh, an author of 25 self-published books or something. Your second paragraph is your pitch for the book that you're trying to get published. And then the third one is basically just concluding a little statement about hopefully that this is a kind of book that you want to represent. And then uh, usually attached to that, depending on what the agent wants for submissions, they might have it on their website or you might email them and they'll tell you what they want. They may want a, a more thorough synopsis of the book or they will want the first 10 pages. And then from there, they're going to decide if it's something that they're going to rep or they're not going to rep. And if they don't rep, good luck. You just keep querying agents until one of them decides to rep you and then you let them do the work of getting it published until a publisher uh, wants to give you a contract for publishing your book. At that point, the publisher really handles the entire process. So they will handle revisions. They will tell you what to rewrite in your book, uh, what to cut in a lot of cases, or what kind of things are not acceptable to publish. And um, it's your job as the author to make those changes uh, according to their editorial order. They might have an in-house editor that, you know, tells you what to do. And uh, so you do that. That's something that you don't pay for, right? So the big advantage of traditional publishing is that uh, as an author, it you're not having to pay for these things. You're not having to find an editor that you think is good and pay him to edit your book, right? Um, the publisher will find a cover artist and will design a cover so you don't have to find a cover designer and find an artist and try to get art and a cover designer to work and pay them out of your pocket to get your cover they'll do that and they'll do that according to their expertise if they uh, you know if they're good at what they're doing then they'll know you know the genre that you've written a book in is going to have a cover that's like this and so we're going to make a cover that fits that genre and you don't even have to worry about that kind of stuff. Um, if, by the way, going one step backwards, you if you're gonna query agents, you can find books that are similar to yours and then query agents that rep that book, right? Um, so they'll do that, they'll typeset the book, they'll print the book. Now, technically they don't print the book. A lot of people uh, think that there's like, you know, there's a publisher like Macmillan or something and they have a big place where there's printing presses, printing books. No, what they actually do is they order it from a printer. Yes, a third party, a third party printer, maybe in China, it may be somewhere else. And that third party printer will print off books according to their specifications and uh, maybe print off the dust jacket and that kind of stuff if it's a hardback. Uh, then they'll ship them to stores where stores will stock them if they ship them to stores. Um, they may not, depending on how they want to distribute your book. It may be like an order only kind of thing. It just kind of depends on the book and the quantities may vary. Um, then, you know, this is after you've signed a contract, right? You'll get, start getting paid royalties after you've done what's called recoup your advance. So if they give you an, an advance and there's no, these days, I think there's really no guarantee that you're going to get an advance or that it's going to be sizable enough to make a difference in your life. You know, I've heard of people getting advances. It's like, I got a $800 advance, which is really sweet. But you know, used to be advances were like 15 grand, you know, <laughs> which can make a difference in someone's life. Probably not enough for you to like quit your day job on the advance. Well, at, once the book starts selling, if it starts selling, 
and you will earn or earn royalties. The thing is, is that you have to earn back in your par portion of the royalties the entire equivalent of the uh, advance before you will get paid any extra royalties on your book. You as an author will probably get between, I don't know, usually the rule of thumb is like between 10 and 15%, but I've seen maybe as low as 5% royalties. So if you're getting, let's say, 10 or 15% royalties, that means 10 or 15% on like the printer's portion or the publisher's portion of the book, uh, which may not be the retail cost at all. So you may get a book in the retail cost for like a, you know, a, kind of a trade hardback would be say $20. And you're like, oh great, I make um, $3 a book because I'm making 15 cents, uh, you know, 15% royalties. That's pretty good actually, right? That's really not bad profit, $3 a book, except it's going to be out of usually the, the publisher's part of that, what they're actually selling the book for. And that may be $8. So you may be getting, you know, 75 cents, <laughs> a dollar. You may be getting one, maybe a dollar fifty if they're selling it for $10, right? But often less than that. And if you're selling paperbacks, it's that much less uh, per book. Now, if you get paid a thousand dollar advance and you're making a dollar per book, that means you have to sell a thousand books before you begin to recoup. A thousand books doesn't sound like a lot when you're thinking that you're going to be the next, you know, Stephen Hunter, but a thousand, a thousand books is a lot, guys. A thousand books is a lot. It's I have a really hard time selling a thousand books, right? I've done it. I have multiple books that have sold in the thousands, um, but uh, selling them in just getting a book to one thousand sales is a huge milestone. That's like a bestseller. Okay, just so you know, uh, this is why I'm very skeptical of claims of certain people like saying, "Oh, well, I, I've sold six million books." It's like, how come I haven't heard of you? What do you mean? It's like six million books is like Jurassic Park. <laughs> you know, six million books is is like you know uh, Dan, a Dan Brown book, right? It's like I haven't heard of you. It makes me think you haven't actually sold six thousand six six million copies of a book. There's not a lot of readers, right? People are not like reading a lot. A thousand a thousand copies is a lot. Okay, and then after that, then you're making your royalties, right? You're making maybe getting a royalty check every quarter. Uh, and that's how the publishing works. Now, uh, what may happen is a publisher will have the books printed, have the books shipped either through a distributor or from them from their own warehouse to you know whatever bookstore wants to stock them. <clears throat> and usually they have an agreement where the bookstore will stock a lot of stuff. So they can, you know, the bookstore will agree to stock the book basically because of an agreement with the distributor. After a certain amount of time, if that book hasn't sold, the bookstore the bookstore doesn't actually buy the book. They basically get the book without paying for it, and then once the book is sold, all the money goes everywhere, right? They kind of it's not like exactly credit, but basically think of like they buy things on credit. Thing with that is that you only have so much shelf space. So if the book doesn't sell, you need to send it back and um, get rid of this inventory that is a liability to you that you're not getting rid of that you're not selling. Well, the thing is, it costs a lot of money to ship books. So what they typically do is take the dust jacket off, or if it's a paperback, rip the front cover off and throw the book away or burn it or shred it or turn it into toilet paper, whatever they're going to do with it. And then they send back just a big envelope full of the covers, right? Because that's just really cheap. Um, so what may happen if you get a book traditionally published is that you get an advance, then the books go out, the books don't sell well, your books are all burned, and then you never make another dime or get another book published because you didn't recoup. That is a possibility when you are in the traditional publishing realm. If you have a book, even you know your first book, which is like a development book, if it doesn't recoup, you may be out of the business forever at that point. You know, You never know. Unfortunately, there's a lot of authors that end up that way. They even maybe, uh, sign up to do like here's a trilogy and the first book comes out and it bombs and the next two just they can't even publish them because they don't have the rights to the book anymore so the thing is when you do with the the when you go with a traditional publisher the tr the publisher holds the rights to the book to publish so if the publisher decides to let that book go out of print it has to be out of print for a number of years before the rights revo revert back to you the author and you could publish it through a different publisher or self-publish it or something like that 
Okay, so that's basically how traditional publishing works. The big advantage of traditional publishing is that you don't have to do all the stuff that I'm going to talk about for any publishing. It doesn't require you to front a bunch of money. If a publisher is telling you that they're a hybrid publisher, they are what are called a vanity publisher. I will cover that towards the end of this lecture. Okay. Real publishers do not require money from you. They are taking the risk of publishing your book. They are paying for the materials. They are paying for the distribution and they are therefore taking a big cut of the profits. Okay. So the advantage is you don't have to worry about that stuff. So if you could get a book traditionally published, it can save a lot of headache of you having to learn like what is good cover design? How do I find a good cover designer? How do I hire an artist uh, to do things? How do I format a book? How do I print a book? How do I ship a book? Like all the, th all the ins and outs of publishing could take up a lot of time. And so if you can get something traditionally published, then that can save a lot of time. The downside is you'll be making less money over time compared to somebody who is self-publishing who actually knows what they're doing and is successful. And that's the condition. You have to know what you're doing and you have to be successful in order to make more money doing the self-publishing thing. So let me talk about self-publishing. We call it self-publishing, but really you're not doing things yourselves. You are just taking on the role of the publisher, just like how the person who is like the editor-in-chief of the publishing house is not printing your book. He's not going down to the printing press and like printing your book, right? He's not editing your book. He's not drawing the cover. He's hiring people to do all those things. It's like a, so it's the business role. So you'll be doing that with self-publishing. <clears throat> what you'll do is if you want to have an editor, you will hire an editor. You'll find an editor that's working hopefully in the genre that you are working in that has edited some books that you think are good. And chances are that's, that's going to be like the best that's how you know that that person knows what they're doing is that they've edited books, which are good, right? And so you hire them for whatever their cost is and uh, that you have to front that. That's gonna be out of your pocket. Uh, after you have hired them and you've worked with them to make the necessary revisions, you will then have to typeset the book. You'll have to decide what am I going to do with this now? How am I going to make this public? And you can make it public a number of different ways, right? So you can publish through Amazon. That is, Amazon holds a near monopoly. They are a hegemon of the publishing space, the book publishing space now. If you're not publishing a book through Amazon, you're really not in the publishing business at this point in time. Uh, it's it's either a, a play or go home kind of thing with Amazon. There's few alternatives if you want to avoid Amazon entirely. Most alternatives are, can you make more money outside of Amazon than just doing Amazon. That's the kind of the way, right? So if you crowdfund a book, if you do some kind of crowdfunding campaign, you'll probably still want to put it out through Amazon because there's someone who didn't hear about your crowdfund. There's somebody who's not going to buy it on your website. There's somebody who's not going to buy the book through Patreon, not going to buy the book through Ko-Fi or whatever it is. And by the way, you can get all my books. You can buy them from Patreon. Um, or you can be a part of my Patreon and get a free book every month. Um, same thing with Ko-Fi. You can buy them through Ko-Fi or get or is it coffee, whatever, or, you know, buy them from a regular store. All of those are options. So how do I publish? A bunch of different ways, but Amazon's the big one. The way Amazon will publish a book is you have an ebook, you have a product that's your book. Your book needs a cover, so you have to go find a cover artist to make the cover image. You, then you have to find a cover designer to do the, to the, to do the, uh, basically make the cover with the fonts and everything, right? All the words. Ideally, you'll have someone who does both of those, who can photocomp a cover for you and do all the words. If you have a visual artist, chances are they're not going to be able to do both. And I remember having a discussion with a painter who's like, well, I prefer to do all this. I'm like, Yours, your, your typesetting is not correct, right? It's just not genre correct. And that's just not what your strength is, right? Your strength is doing the image. I would want you to do the image and not do the words. Plus, I would want to change the words at a future date, right? I might want to add book one or something onto onto something. And the artist wasn't interested in doing that. I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, I'm not going to work with you because, um, you know, that's how it is. I I need to be able to have the ability to to change the words and to control those and know what fonts are going to signal genre and stuff like that. So when you design a cover. 
At that point, you really have to know what genre you're in because the cover design needs to fit with the genre. A lot of people kind of miss the boat on cover design and they think, oh, you know, I want to have like a cover that's like this. I'm like, that's great. But people will think that it's not in the genre you're writing in. Your cover actually has to look like other covers in the genre. It has to be generic, for lack of a better term, or people won't know what genre it's in. There are fonts which communicate genre. There are colors which communicate genre, like yellow. You notice all the Westerns have yellow covers, right? The, the color yellow is in almost every Western design. So if you're writing a Western, chances are you're going to want to use the, a, a warm color palette that features the color yellow, at least in the font, if in no other part of the image. It just signals to people. There are certain fonts that say Western. And sometimes I see like covers done by, I don't know, designers who don't, who don't really know this stuff, aren't really like, um, like, aren't really clued, you know, cued into knowing what genres are supposed to look like. And so they, they mix these things and, and come up with a design that doesn't look bad except for the fact that you look at it, you're like, I don't know what kind of book this is. Is this a Western or a fantasy book? I've seen fantasy books with like the Western style newspaper fonts with like the little serifs in the middle of the, of the letters. That's like, okay, that looks like it's a, it's a spaghetti Western something, right? It doesn't look like a fantasy book or it's all yellow with something like that. And then there's an elf on the cover. You're like, is this some sort of genre mashup? What is this? It's like, no, it's straight fantasy. Okay, well, I thought maybe this was elves in the Wild West, right? A cover can, can communicate a lot. So you have to know the basics of cover design, even if you're going to be hiring someone else to do the work. Because you could hire somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. And if you don't know that they don't know what they're doing, you're going to pay for something that's going to like tank your book. Okay, so you have to know some basics of cover design. I have a ton of content on the channel for like, you know, how to do basic cover design as well as how to know if a cover is bad. So you'll have to hire the, the cover designer. You take that cover, you take your manuscript. If you, if you have a word formatted manuscript, uh, and I have tons of content on how to format your ebook using Microsoft Word, using styles. So you have a, a main style that has like a quarter inch indent, not a tab, an indent, you just have to learn how to do this stuff. Once you get used to it, you're never going to put tabs in your documents ever again because they're a waste of time. You, you do the correct formatting for the paragraph. All the all the paragraphs will come out looking great on an e-reader. You need headings. Uh, so you need a heading style. And then it'll create automatic an automatic table of contents. It'll create automatic links when you turn it into an e-book. Um, I have lots of videos on that, how to format your e-book using just Microsoft Word. You don't need to use expensive programs or things like that uh, to format your ebook. Okay, you can just do it with Microsoft Word and that's probably the best way because when it comes to ebooks, simpler is better. Unless you're doing a book that for whatever reason has a bunch of images, um, you just wanna keep, keep the formatting as simple as possible. It'll have the least number of errors across the maximum number of devices that way. Okay, so yeah. You do that, you upload that, you have to then decide what categories your book is in. I think on Amazon you can have three now. You used to have two. Um, so you pick those categories and then there's like seven or eight keywords you put in on Amazon. I have um, a video that goes through every single step on this for how to publish a book on Amazon, how to actually take your, you take your, your cover file, take your manuscript, put them on Amazon and publish them. Okay, but I'm just telling you the steps for how to do that. You'll have keywords. You need those keywords to identify what's in your book. Okay, what special things are in your book that are like things that are in other books. You don't want to put keywords in that no one would ever enter into a search bar, but keywords that are related to what they would be searching for. So if you have a book with elves, elf might be in it. It might be about elvish stuff or the fae or fairies and you put fairies in it, right? If it's got werewolves, obviously werewolf should be a keyword werewolf okay if vampires are in it vampire right if it's a romance story romance vampire romance werewolf romance paranormal romance can be a keyword so really specific genre information really specific content information that goes in the keyword boxes next page on amazon you'll have like some basic stuff and then you have to decide to price it okay 
Pricing an ebook is a constant game of back and forth. You want to price an ebook appropriately to maximize your money. If you make your ebook, you're like, I've heard people like, why don't you make your ebooks $15.99? I'm like, because no one will buy them at $15.99. Okay. It's like, there's, then you have to sell one fifth as many ebooks. The problem is you sell one one thousandth as many ebooks, right? So if, if I took like, um, City of Silver, I think I sell the ebook for 99 cents. You know, if I took, and I don't remember how, how many thousands of copies of that I've sold, but if, if I took it and I made that $15.99 or whatever the maximum is, $9.99, it's not that I would sell, you know, 100 copies. It's like I would sell two copies to like just to people that really like me on the channel. And they would have no reviews and no exposure, right? So you have to. It doesn't mean that you make it make every book 99 cents, but there's a, a sweet spot. If it's 299 and you're getting 67% royalties making, you know, $2 a book, which is really good, then 299 it is if that's going to maximize you're getting more copies versus if you do it 599 and you're making 350, but you're selling half as many books, you're going to end up a little bit behind on that, right? So you have to experiment with pricing a little bit. Generally speaking, if the book is very short, it's okay to have a low price. And if it's longer, it's okay to have a higher price. Likewise, if you're writing a series, the later books in the series can have the higher price point. So you can do book one, 99 cents, book two, 299, book three, 499 on out, right? Sometimes consumers will just, they, it's not that they care that much about price, right? They're not sitting there like, ah, oh, it's a 299, right? But for whatever reason, around four ninety nine, around five dollars, they stop and think. Even though that's just like still the the price of a cup of coffee, you know, they still stop and think. You know, um, is this worth four ninety nine? Whereas like three dollars, it's like they won't even think about it. There's a there's a thing that happens. And nine ninety nine, spending ten dollars on a book, especially an ebook, people will just they'll hesitate big time on it unless they feel like there's some special value with that 1099. That's um, some of the interesting things that happen with pricing. So there's a psychological aspect of pricing and you have to be willing to play around with it. If you're a trad publisher, you probably just put it 999 and just expect everybody's gonna buy the print version because that's what you wanna sell anyway, right? That's how you put an ebook out. Putting out a paper book is not that big a deal. Like on Amazon, you put like create paperback I have videos on how to format paperbacks. You take your manuscript, you set the page size correct, you set the margins correct, you set the gutters correct, you create headers and footers, you create page numbers, you make sure all the, the sections link up so that the page numbers don't start over again somewhere in the middle of the document. You double check it, you make sure it works. Then you take your ebook, uh, you take that the number of pages that you've made, you plug it into a little link um, on Amazon, which will give you a template and that you can just put in like Photoshop or Inkscape or whatever editing program you want. Put your ebook on one side, make the rest of it black, put a blurb on one side, put your name on, the, you know, put the name of the book on the text. Boom, you have a wrap cover. Or you can have Amazon do the wrap cover for you. And as long as it's just black with like a basic font, it'll actually look fine. I know that I will definitely maybe... Well, not definitely. I'll probably get flack for saying that the Amazon, like I don't ever use them. I use like full wraps. Like, so look at Needle Ash here, right? You know, there's a full wrap. The image goes all the way around the book and it looks very nice. And I, and I like it that way. Um, and so a lot of them have full wrap. A lot of them are just black on the back. Uh, I'll get flack for saying Amazon's, you know, like automatic cover maker is actually okay. But if you're starting with a really good ebook cover, just having black probably looks fine. I'll, let me see if I have an example somewhere. Hold on. Let's see. This one black. No, this one's good. <laughs> really don't do a lot of just black covers. This one's black. All right, it doesn't look too bad. Whoops. Here's the like needle ash part three. So this one, it just has a good ebook cover, the nice colors, blue and yellow. Turn it over, it's just black. Just black with words. 
it's a little more design here and like if you do it through amazon it's just gonna all be like white but that doesn't matter that much you know here's a major you know here's a regular traditionally published book in the in the six by nine size which is one of my favorite sizes um and in fact i recommend this book cool x all of atlantis with all these beautiful illustrations in it um black and white illustrations what does it have it just has a black cover on the back it's just black with a blurb right so that's another thing you'll need i forgot that let me please uh, excuse me for glazing over that you need a blurb so what's the blurb the blurb is this part on the back of the book that says like uh you know it gives you just a, it sells the story right you know da, da, da. it's just like a it's a a setup of the story so hey you should buy the story um, that's what that is. I have stuff on how to make a blurb. You're going to introduce the main character. You're going to introduce uh, the basic conflict and create some uncertainty in the reader so that they're going to want to buy the book to solve the question that you're giving them. That's how you write a blurb. Okay. Um, and you're going to put the blurb on the back of that and you're going to use the blurb for your description with your Amazon ebook. Okay. If you have all that stuff, that's publishing on Amazon. But before you have done that, what do you have to do? You have to find a cover and have it designed or learn to do one yourself. Um, pay for it, right? Pay for the images if you're doing it yourself. You can't just get images off of Google, right? You have to buy the rights to those images, guys. Um, or just use AI images, which um, don't require royalties, right? Um, a lot of people are like, you can't use AI images then artists are out of work. It's like we've been Photoshopping covers for like 20 years. Artists have been out of work because of costs for a long time, right? Um, so you have those, maybe you've paid for editing, right? Uh, you have to format the ebook, right? Proofread it maybe, uh, you probably need to do that. Otherwise that's it, you're making it public. So that's making it public on Amazon. You can use Drafted Digital, which is the service I recommend for going to any, every other store. However, you get a lot more royalties for being Amazon exclusive. And the increase in royalties you get for being Amazon exclusive, if you're just doing stores, will very much outweigh the extra sales you would get on any other platform. It's just a numbers thing because, and I've done it, you know, 90 something percent of the sales come through uh, Amazon and like virtually nothing comes through anything else, right? Like my draft to digital royalty checks are so low. It's like, I don't even think about them, right? It's all Amazon. So just keep that in mind. Now, how exclusive you want to make them to Amazon, right? Like I technically give my books away uh, that are Amazon exclusive through Patreon and stuff because that's not considered publishing them on another platform. Um, at least it wasn't back when I started doing that. Uh, it's not like legal advice or anything like that. And if Amazon finds that you're publishing something somewhere else, they can like kick you out of that program or kick the book out of it at least and not give you like the full royalties. But at least in the last few years, they almost never check up on that. Like it's almost not like Amazon doesn't care about their book sales part really anymore um so yeah that's publishing that's making it public it's not the same thing as marketing marketing is a whole different ball game as far as like public pub, uh, publishing your book goes how do you get your book to rank up and like that's a whole another can of worms to open up mate that's how you make your book public draft to digital process is very very similar um if you want i could make a video like walking through a draft to digital process Cool thing about draft to digital is you can make your book free if you wanted to just uh, have it on stores to try to gather readers. Like they get the book and you encourage them to sign up for your mailing list or something, then you can make the book free through through draft to digital. And you can use price matching if it's on draft to digital to make the Amazon book free, which is where you're going to get a crap ton of free downloads. Okay, so if you can get a, the book to be free on Amazon forever, like perma perma free then you'll get a lot of downloads, which means you can gather in a lot of readers. The, the, I was talking to someone on the, you know, on my Patreon Discord, my patron Discord, about like, you know, <clears throat> how many stories should I publish and behind a paywall? I'm like, the truth is you have to build the audience before you can ask them for money. You have to provide them some reason for them 
to know you and to buy your product, which means you're gonna have to publish free articles. You're gonna have to give free content away to get people interested in who you are, uh, especially if you're just starting at ground zero as nobody, right? You don't have exposure through some other platform or you're not known for something else, right? Like uh, if <laughs> you could have, uh, if you're a rock star publishing, if you're Dave Mustaine, right? You don't really need to have free content to get an audience. You can publish a book, even though you've never done that before and charge money for it and get an audience, right? <clears throat> yeah, Divine Duckworth says to get the 70% royalty on Amazon, you must keep your ebook pricing between $2.99 and $9.99. Um, for 70% royalty to 35% royalties on books over $9.99, right? So they're really encouraging you to not make it more than $9.99. That was a big thing from about 15 years ago, uh, was nine, all the eBooks are $9.99. And then when they let authors start pricing them down, the first thing they did was start competing with each other and getting them down. 99 cents is a really good intro price, but yeah, you're gonna make 30 cents on like that 99 cent sale versus if you make it just $2.99, you can make basically $2. Right, so not just by increasing the the price threefold, you increase your royalties by a lot more than threefold, by sixfold, right? At that break point, and then um, you know once you, there's no real reason to price an ebook over nine ninety nine unless you're going with a textbook model. So if you're selling a textbook, and you, in which case you already know that, yeah, you can make a nine hundred dollar ebook if you want. There's people who sell ten thousand dollar ebooks that include like some kind of consulting service or something as part of the ebook sale. It's just a way to like sell a consulting service. Or if you have a textbook, the textbook will be $95 for the ebook. Or you can rent the ebook, right? Those sorts of things. Anyway, that's that's basically making your thing publish. Uh, I'm gonna, before I talk about other ways to publish and other things like serial publication, um, vanity publishers, uh, like publishing on your website, like really self-publishing where like you are the one selling the book too, which we can talk about. Um, keep in mind, like when we're self-publishing, what we are really doing is being the, the business side of the publisher and um, Amazon is really selling the book. They're really kind of the publisher of record, I guess, in that, in that case. Uh, and we are kind of putting our thing on their, on their storefront, right? All right, let me check the, let me check the, the comments and stuff before I go. Uh, any further here um, let's see here uh, the way I'm looking to go about my own novels is publish as a web novel on various sites that's serial publishing we can talk about that build a fan base it's got to be free it's, that's just how it has to be like people are not going to pay some pay for something they don't know anything about unless you are convincing them through advertising which costs money right make money on patreon hopefully again you have to build the audience before you can do that uh, then hire an editor, maybe, and an artist. Turn each complete book into a light novel and self-publish. Yeah, get a light novel artist. You have to pay for the art. But what's cool about that is that, uh, and this is another thing too, whenever you are hiring somebody, you always want to do it work for hire. You don't want to be splitting your royalties with other people if you're doing self-publishing. Anyone that has some sort of offer like that, don't do it. Talked about this with the problem with uh, audiobooks. There's an option on ACX, which is kind of Amazon's way to self-publish uh, audiobooks that would let you split royalties with a narrator. Don't ever do that. If you are thinking of doing that, you're either going to be screwing the narrator or screwing yourself, or you're both getting screwed. <laughs> so all of those are bad. Work for hire is the proper business arrangement. You hire somebody to do a job for you. When it's done, it's done. You own the rights to the completed product. That's work for hire. That's what you want with someone doing a cover design. That's what you want with someone doing narration if you're doing an audiobook. That's what you want with somebody doing formatting. Never split your royalties. Your editor doesn't need your royalties. If you're traditionally publishing, yeah, your your agent is going to take your royalties. Your publisher is going to take your royalties and you're going to get what's left over, but they're doing, you know, that's how they that's how they make their money, right? The publisher makes their money by publishing the book and selling it for money, <laughs> of which they give you a portion in, in the form of royalties. And the, the agent makes his money basically by just taking taking some of the money from every book you sell and every advance you make. That's how they make their money. Okay. I read your Needle Ash series of books over at a subscription service called Everand, formerly known as Scribd, and I definitely enjoy them all. Okay. I, 
That's interesting. I'm not sure if I ever published them there. I don't think I did. Well, that's interesting to know. I might have to check up on that because I don't think I ever published them there. But it's cool that you read them. Thank you for reading them. Um, then higher and yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, YouTube keeps deleting my uh, comments when I mention the P word in Amazon. Okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, do, do, do. Ne Nilo Seven in is publishing a fantasy book. He's the lead in Insomnium. Okay. Um, is it possible for books to ship with free prime shipping with any third party aggregators? I do not know that. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. So I don't know if doing draft to digital physical copies will ship prime. Yeah, I don't know that. I've gotten prime shipping on people that I'm sure have used Lulu, but I'm not, again, I'm not sure if Amazon is like stocking that or if it's like a, I'm not sure how that works. So I can't really answer. Piracy is a problem with eBooks though. It's fairly trivial to crack the encryption. Piracy is not a problem with eBooks. So contr like piracy is not a problem with eBooks. Um, and for, for people watching this, piracy is not a problem with eBooks. In other words, people are not pirating your book. Uh, this is a, 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 this is a, I don't want to call it a mistake. I, I think it's a misunderstanding of people who are new to this business that they're going to be losing money to piracy and they start worrying about piracy and people stealing their book. People have to know who you are and know what your book is before they ever think about stealing it. Right? Someone might steal a Dan Brand book, a Dan Brown book. Right, they might pirate a Dan Brown book because they know who he is, and they know that the book he wrote is something they might want to read and that other people like, but they may not want to pay him money. They might be cheap, cheapskates. They're not pirating your book because they have no idea who you are. Right. So before anyone thinks of pirating your book, they have to have an idea that you are, exist and have a book that they might want to read at some point. So you know, piracy is really not an ebook problem. I don't even bother putting DRM on my books usually. Uh, there's like an option that you can check in like Amazon Publishing to have digital rights management. I just check that off because, you know, if you get the ebook and you want to read it on some other proprietary hardware or some third-party reader, who cares, man? I don't care if you do that. Um, and it's like, oh, well, I'm gonna just give this ebook away to someone. It's like, okay, and then they read the book and become my fan and probably buy another book from me, right? You know, like, you know what I'm saying? And especially when it's like a $3 product. The product is so cheap. Who's going to, who's going to, like, who's bothering to pirate a $3 book? It's kind of the, it's kind of something with games too. You know, piracy is a big problem in countries outside of the United States. Like, why is there... I'd say the biggest thing that stops people from pirating movies is just that it's more convenient to use Netflix and more convenient to use HBO Max. So just making a better service than piracy makes people not pirate things. It's actually a lot more trouble to pirate Lord of the Rings than it is to just watch it on HBO. And you have to find a torrent. You have to hope that the torrent is right, that it's the right rip of the, the movies. Then you have to torrent them. Then you have to figure out how to get them over to your TV and play them, or you watch them on your computer monitor or whatever it's going to be. Um, it can be a lot more trouble to like put a pirated Lord of the Rings on your TV than it is to just watch it on HBO. So same thing with Steam. It's just more convenient to buy a game on Steam than to bother pirating it most of the time. And most people are not so broke they can't afford. Like if you're doing an indie game and your game is $10, or $15, most people are just not going to bother pirating it ever. They're just not going to do it, right? They'll wait for it for you to put it on sale if they don't feel like it's worth $10 and then they might buy it, right? But they probably just won't pirate it. People in Brazil might pirate it, but you could do, you could change your pricing for it for Brazil if you had that problem, you know, or Russia. And um, then people would probably just buy it there anyway instead of pirating it so that they have like 
the full version and they're not worried about downloading viruses and crap like that. So yeah, pirating is actually not a problem with eBooks uh, really at all. Um, at least in, in terms of business stuff, it's not a, it shouldn't be a concern of 99% of authors, right? And the thing is, if you're an indie or you're traditionally published, we're in the era of social media. It's about a relationship between you and your reader, right? Your, your writing is communicative. It's communicative art. It's not just a product that someone like consumes like a, a cake, right? They don't like, I am eating the book, right? They're reading a book and getting to know you as an author through it. So having that relationship usually means that people aren't going to just pirate your books if they like you. They're probably not going to do that. If they're dead broke and you have a relationship with them, they might ask for a free copy of the book. It's like, man, I'm really broke. I want to read this book. I'm like, I'll just give you a free copy, you know, and you know, you can buy another book later when you have money. I don't care. Right. I don't worry about it. So anyway, yeah, to me, it's not a problem at all. Um, and you don't really need to concern yourself with it. Uh, free is the plan for the web novels, a Royal Road, Scribble Hub, my own site when I make it, etc. Most hires want the flat rate anyway. Exactly. Yes. Yes, to be, and I agree. A percentage is nothing. A percentage of nothing is very little. So cash up front is king. Absolutely. And that's the thing that I, that was the big point I made talking about the problem with audiobooks is that with audiobooks, a royalty split is always bad for at least one party, if not both. So let's say I am a nobody author and I have no money. And I convince a narrator to split the royalties with me. And we sell 10 copies of the ebook. That royalty, that, that narrator worked for like 10 cents an hour. Well, that sucks. If people deserve to get, be paid for their work. He's not going to feel good about working for 10 cents an hour unless it was just for the experience and that was part of the agreement. Hey, you can do this for experience and for like part of your portfolio, but we're probably not going to sell any books. And he's like, okay, I'm okay not making any money on this and just doing it for an experience. Right? Most people are not up front. Like authors, especially new authors, are delusional about how much money they can make in this business. So they're like, yeah, we'll just split the world, we'll split the royalties and, and it all work because he's doing work. And it's like, now nah, what ends up happening is you screw over the narrator by not selling any books. Or um, you screw yourself over, right? Let's say you're really successful and you and you do a royalty split. And if it costs a thousand dollars to make an audiobook. Uh, with a narrator and then all of a sudden you're selling it hand over fist you're paying that narrator ten thousand dollars to do a thousand dollar job well that sucks especially when the job of marketing it and all that other stuff marketing and promotion is all done by the author the narrator does none of that all right so they're basically getting free work out of you to sell something that they get royalties for that's if you're very successful so if you're very successful you're you're hurting your own self and your own business rather than just paying him a flat fee. And if you're in a circumstance where it's like the amount that I expect to sell could never make up for the cost of a flat fee, you can just not make the audiobook. That's actually the wise course of action for most new authors is to not even bother with audiobooks. They're a high cost, okay margin, low volume, uh, low volume channel. You hear a bunch of people like the, the the book gurus are gonna tell you that it's some kind of freaking growth market. It was a growth market in 2014. It's saturated now. It's not a growth market and the market collapsed in 2020 after the lockdowns, okay? That's just the fact about um, audiobooks and publishing audiobooks. And you were always going to sell a tiny portion of your total sales in audiobooks. So if you sell a thousand copies of something, your maximum sales for the audiobook is about a hundred copies, right? So like Keys to Prolific Creativity, which is a pretty popular book of mine, I think I've sold 112 audiobooks and almost all of those were in the first three months it was out. So if you are paying a thousand dollars, like I probably would not have made a you know a thousand dollar audiobook, I probably wouldn't have still broken even even on a really successful book for me. I recorded that myself because I happen to have um, a lot of experience public speaking and acting and reading, and I have production experience as well, right? So I was able to do that myself. A lot of authors can't do that. You just have to kind of look at the investment. Why don't I do more audiobooks if I record it myself? Well, it's a time investment. If I'm paying myself 50 cents an hour, that doesn't really feel very good either. You know what I'm saying? So. It just doesn't end up working out, you know? That's all. 
Um, do you know that the book uh, Argyle, of which a movie adaptation is now coming out, sold a bunch of copies because of a fake rumor that it was written by Taylor Swift? I did not know that. Uh, I could. I have heard stories of people trying to get movie deals by buying their own books to make them bestsellers. This was a controversy four years ago, maybe. Um, it was the wife of a movie producer. They basically, well, he wanted to have his studio option this, but they couldn't just make it a screenplay, right? They needed to be a best-selling book. So they were buying the maximum number of copies from like every bookstore because they kind of figured it out. It's like we could spend $50,000 buying the books and then we'll option or, or you know, we'll sell the screen uh, screen rights for $500,000 or a million. It's an easy investment to make. You just have a fake bestseller. You buy all the copies of your own book. It goes on the bestseller list. People will buy it simply because it's a bestseller. They It doesn't matter that you bought all the copies of the book. It's a total scam. And then it's a bestseller. It's on the New York Times young adult bestseller list. Why don't we um, sell the screenwriting? Why don't we sell the screen rights for $500,000? That means that as long as you can get away with buying the books, you can buy up to and including $500,000 worth of books to make that sale and then make money, maybe turning it into a movie. I guess this is another thing about the publishing side of things. It's often very fake. There's a lot of gurus out there telling you how to sell books. This is not exactly related to publishing, but publishing costs a lot of money. Right? It's not free for most people. It costs time and it costs money. So you want to be wise with your investments with this. Be very cautious when you hear a guru tell you that his, he has some sort of proven method for selling 10,000 copies of a book or something like that or whatever it is, a million copies of a book. Be very, very, very weary because what he wants is your money. If he could make tons of money selling books, then he would just sell books. He would be selling you a course on how to advertise for them. Okay? Insomnium is a Finnish melodic death metal band. I've heard of them. Right? I'd want people to pirate my books. And these people will be reading them. Yeah. I got it from Fiverr for $10. Well, I'm not sure what you got from Fiverr. I also plan to make audiobooks from my novels and narrating them myself, uploading them on YouTube, Rumble, etc. Yeah. Easy to do. Battlefield Earth sold so many copies because of the Church of Scientology ordered their members to buy a bunch of copies. I think the organization itself bought a bunch too. Oh, that's true. I know this is something that conservative um, conservative TV show hosts and radio hosts do. So this is a scam that they do. And I, the New York Times kind of started putting asterisks on books for this reason, for certain books. Um, if they were there were large quantities bought by a single buyer, um, like a book club or something like that. So like, let's say you're Glenn Beck and you work for Fox News still or wherever. I'm not sure what Glenn Beck's, Glenn Beck's doing. Let's do Bill O'Reilly. He got fired, but but he used this. Oh, Sean Hannity. There we go. Sean Hannity's definitely done this scam, right? It's just a scam. Uh, but what you do is you sell a membership. It's like the Sean Hannity fan club. And as part of being a member in the Sean Hannity fan club, you get a free copy of Sean Hannity's new book, Conservative, Conservative. We are conservatives. We, we use the word conservative and therefore we're conservatives. New York Times bestseller because they bought 500,000 copies of the book. That's why it's on the New York Times bestseller list. Then when you, when you join the Sean Hannity fan club, he sends you a copy of Conservatives, Conservatives, we call ourselves conservatives. That's how you know we're conservatives is we use the word conservative. And you get a free copy of that. Quote, free copy of that. What did he do? He made he bought books to make his time, book go number one on the New York Times bestseller nonfiction list. And then he made recouped that cost by by selling a membership which included that as a free book. A free hard copy, hardback copy of the book. Right. So they do that kind of thing. Um and they did it. There were so many that did it. I think Bill O'Reilly did it. I'm pretty sure Sean Hannity did it. Like they all do this, right? Rather than selling a book and having people having the sales be people who bought the book to read it, it is. I bought five hundred thousand copies of it. It's technically a bestseller, yeah, right? Um, or probably not even that many. Let's say because honestly, a, a nonfiction bestseller is like five thousand copies. 
So they buy five or 10,000 copies. Boom, number one New York Times bestselling list. They can't, they can sell half a million memberships, but they sell a bunch of memberships and then the membership is $30. The book costs them 15 to buy, make a little profit and recoup the loss of buying all the books. And it's and then they can write, of course they write off the cost of buying the books on their taxes because it's part of the membership. So it all works out beautifully, big scam. One of the issues with audiobooks is their size. It's a good idea to only sell compressed audio. Uh, the lossless files are too large for most buyers and a waste of bandwidth. I kind of let the the store figure that out. Um, like if you're thinking like AAC or WAV format, um, I usually, for audiobooks especially, you're not really losing anything by going with um, going with the Apple audio codec rather than FLAC or uh, especially WAV or um, AIF, right? Just use AAC. AAC sounds better than MP3 because of the way that they compress the high end in MP3. If you're doing if you're doing an MP3 that is lower quality, then it you lose a lot of the high end detail. But you don't really need that for an audiobook. It's just the, somebody talking. It's not music where you need like fine details, right? MP3s are just fine. In fact, I think ACX requires an MP3 file, not a WAV file or anything like that. Right, I think ACX requires an MP3 file. Apple uses AAC. AAC is their own um, audio codec. It's a little bit better on the high end. Uh, AAC is used by a bunch of other companies now as well. So like AAC, chances are, if you're like using Spotify, you might be getting the, the songs in an AAC kind of format, right? Unless you're doing Ultra HD, which is like a FLAC or something. So. On Bandcamp, like if you buy my stuff from Bandcamp, Bandcamp, you just upload WAV files and then Bandcamp converts them for you. So if somebody wants a FLAC, it gives them the FLAC version of the file. If somebody wants an MP3, it gives them 192 kilobyte per second MP3. I like that. I like that amount of convenience for sure. Okay, so here's a whole hour, right? That's publishing your book. Let me talk about some of the things that are a little bit outside of those two main things, like Find an agent, query agents, hopefully you get one, maybe later the book gets published. By the way, with traditional publishing, there's a big lag time between writing your book and getting it published, sometimes years. I have I have friends who, I have a friend who she's published, I think, two books through a traditional publisher, like a small, quote, small press. When you hear small press, they don't actually have a press, guys. They're hiring a printer. They're small press because they just don't do a lot of sales and they don't have a lot of authors and they don't have a ton of distribution. So they're a smaller publisher. They don't actually have a press. People, I've, I used to have this idea for years. I thought like Macmillan had a big a big like factory where they made books. It's like, no, they hire other printers to make the books. How does Amazon print the books? Amazon hires other printers to make the books. Half the time your books are gonna be made by Ingram Spark if you're published through Amazon. And then Amazon owns some facilities, but it's like, it's. They contract with like Ingram Spark to just print the books. Okay, so publishing serially. There's so many options for publishing serial fiction these days. My experience is that most of my readers are not interested in serial fiction. Here's some of the ways that you can publish serial fiction. You can do it on your website. You can do it through Blogger. You can do it through an independent blog website such as Substack or Medium. Those are all good options. Substack is a particularly good option because you can build a, um, a log of subscribers that every time you put out that new next installment of your series, they get emailed that you have a new installment. So Substack could be really good for serial fiction. I haven't used it for that. I only use it for publishing my nonfiction content, okay? Uh, and if you're not a subscriber to that, you should be because I write some cool articles on that that are a little bit more to the point than a lot of my YouTube videos. Possible. There's like Wattpad, but some of these are directed towards market segments that your book may not fit into. If you are writing stuff that teenagers like, then yeah, like Wattpad might be a, a fine way to publish. Same thing with Kindle Vela. As near as I can tell, nobody's using Kindle Vela. That it's basically a dead platform. I 
will sometimes get money from Amazon for having books on Kindle Vela, but I don't see anybody reading them on it. So some of the books that I have on Kindle Vela, people ask, when are you going to take Bright Children off of Kindle Vela so I can read it? Because I have a whole bunch of readers that are not ever going to read something on Kindle Vela, whether I put it on there or not. Most of the people who are doing really well on Kindle Vela are authors who were already had a big audience and a really uh, involved uh, email list and were able to get their readers to buy into Kindle Vela just for their story. It's not, the organic growth on it has been really bad, but it's an option. And there's a lot of advantages to publishing serially. The main one being that it forces you to be productive. You know that you have to come out with the next installment this week, or you're coming out with an installment twice a week. It makes you do the work. You you can't go to sleep till you do the work that is due the next day. Um, if you Especially if you feel like you have readers, even if it's like 10 people reading your blog. 10 people, it's like, I can't let those 10 people down. I have to finish the story for them. And it'll help you to finish the book. Uh, Muramasa Blood Drinker was originally published serially. Nobody read it, right? Very few people read it. I would say 15 people maybe, tops, read it that way. Made it as a book, way successful as a book. Most people are just not wanting to read serial fiction for whatever reason, but it's an option. And it's a good option if you're new because the uh, the upsides outweigh the downsides. The upside being you have the potential to build an audience. You are forced to do the work um, on a consistent basis. And consistently doing the work is what's going to help you achieve your goals and actually get your, uh, get your book done. And uh, you can always have the option of taking it off of that later and just publishing it as a regular book. So the if you're new to this, you're fairly new author, then the in my opinion, the advantages of finding some way to do it serially, whether it's on one platform or lots of platforms. To me, I tend to try to pick one just to cut down on the amount of extra work, right? If I have to publish one 1500 word section of a story, to three different sites, that becomes cumbersome to the point where I get annoyed. I don't remember where I published where. Like it's 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 hard enough for me to cross publish things on like two websites, uh, much less like three, four, five websites. But if you're new and you have time, then make a spreadsheet and like check off that you've done each one. Um, and especially since each site will have slightly different ways that formatting works, where like the formatting from your Word document doesn't get pasted in and you have to reformat like italics and things like that. It can be really cumbersome after a while. But anyway, yeah, those are options. Vanity publishing. Let me talk about vanity publishing before I go. I might skip the live right tonight because it's already getting pretty late here. But vanity publishing. This is a thing that popped up decades ago. And vanity publishing was in some ways the original self-publishing. And they called it vanity publishing because people pretended like they had their book published by paying for a company to print copies of their book. There are people who, at least in the past, could make really big use of a vanity publisher. These were people that were um, selling books as an auxiliary to something else they're doing. They're selling books at you know like maybe they're selling a book on diets and they're going to like health conferences and selling the books out of their trunk or they're going to going to like you know different shows trade shows and selling the books at their at their booth that's who vanity publishing was for in the past what a vanity publisher does is they take money from you and then they do the stuff that a publisher would do so they take your money you pay them a big sum of money and they hire They'll edit the book. They'll design the interior. They'll hire a cover artist. And then they will print off a certain number of the copies of the book or maybe put the ebook on Amazon for you. And they'll call themselves like a hybrid publisher, meaning you give us the money and then we'll split the royalties. That's the worst. My, that is the worst possible arrangement is somebody that's like, we're a hybrid publisher. You give us the money to to publish it and then we split the royalties. It's like you're paying them forever for them to just hire an editor and hire a cover designer. And the thing about vanity publishing is chances are they're not going to do a good job with any of that. Got to be real. If you were if you were able to find a vanity vanity publisher and be like I'll just pay you money to do all this stuff that I do on my own. 
and they did it well, then I would see the value of that. But they usually don't. So what typically happens with the vanity publisher, remember they're trying to make a profit. They make the profit from you, the author. They don't make a profit from selling your book. They actually don't give a shit whether it sells. They just don't care, right? They, because they got $5,000 from you. They charge, first of all, a big sum of money. It's like it's $5,000. So what do they do at $5,000? Well, the person who owns the vanity publisher calls himself the editor in chief. He does a rough editing job. He gives you some feedback to make you feel like you're giving getting your book edited by someone who knows what the hell they're doing. Chances are he has no idea what he's doing, right? You fix those things because you're a new author and you're naive and you have no idea what you're doing. So you figure this guy knows what he's doing. I should just do what he says. Cool. Maybe they put the book on Amazon. Nowadays, they put it on Amazon. They write a blurb for it. They don't write, they don't know anything about your genre. You wrote like Mennonite romance. So they write a blurb that kind of describes the story, but they're not going to go research what Mennonite romance blurbs look like. They hire a cover designer. Hey, this is about like Amish people getting married. And they just like, they Photoshop, they like photo bash an Amish person in a field. And then they put a bad font on it. And then it looks like a Western and, and it gets released. Um, they hire their friend to do the to do like the the cover design. And I know of a publishing company that basically just like hires a baby boomer friend of theirs to do the cover design and it always comes out bad because they don't know they haven't done any research into what those genres need to cover to communicate. Do you know what I mean? Like they might know how to operate Photoshop, but they have no idea of like what color things need to be and what kind of images need to be on a cover in order for it to fit correctly in with the genre. And so the whole thing ends up looking like awful. Um, you know, there's one, and then, so uh, I'll give you an example of one of these, which is Calumet editions, uh, Calumet editions, right? If you are on Twitter, chances are you've had people that are uh, Calumet editions authors follow you on Twitter and want you to follow them back. All of this is automated. It's all robots. I could tell you all about how authors try to use automated marketing to avoid doing the work of connecting with readers. <laughs> That's what social media is about, guys. It's about having a relationship with other human beings. It's about knowing that there's a, hey, I'm following this author and he says things that a human says. Maybe I don't like all of them, but at least he's a human. Hey, there's a person who's tweeting at me and he's a human being and he reads my books. Maybe I should treat him like a human being or, you know, you know what I mean, right? Like social media is about building a relationship. People talk about parasocial relationships and that's a whole nother thing. But the point is that it's real people, right? So automating it is kind of against the point of social media. It's turning, trying to turn a Twitter profile, which is for you to communicate back and forth with another person into an advertising platform where you're just not paying Elon Musk to advertise on his platform. It doesn't work. So that's the thing. So like what Calame Editions will do is that they will sell you a package and that package includes like editing and all this stuff with the book. They'll find a cover for it. They'll make you a Twitter profile, which they control. And then they'll take that Twitter profile and they'll automatically tweet out links to the book. That your Twitter profile, which has your name and picture on it, will also retweet all the other Calame Editions authors. So if you look at the feed and I'll, I'll look one up real quick. Okay. I'll look one up. I'm going to see if I could find one if I haven't like blocked them all by now. So it, all it does is retweet. It tweets out the book link and retweets other Calame editions authors. And then it's like, look at this. You got all this engagement because all these Calame edition authors, which are automated accounts, you got a hundred retweets. Okay. They're not real. They're all fake. They're all bots, right? It's just robots talking to robots, trying to convince you, the author, that you are actually getting something for that service that you paid for. You're not getting anything, okay? Uh, it's all robots doing it. They follow other authors. It's automated. Anybody that has the word author or writer in their profile, they're following you. Now, what a lot of automated accounts will do is they will then unfollow people after a certain amount of time. So they follow you, 
you follow back because you're trying to make a connection with a human. You're like, oh, this guy's a writer. I'll, I'll follow him back. I did this in 2014. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, right? I'm going to follow them back. Follow back. Okay. Um, he doesn't interact with me at all. It's because he's a robot. You know, you forget. After a while, you just forget that these people are your followers. Like, look, our, we're, going to, um, we're going to tweet you out from our network of, of Twitter profiles where we have a combined 1 million followers. This is a marketing scam done by book tasters. They do it just with their Twitter. But anyway, Calumet Editions will do this. They'll make every. It's all fake, right? Uh, there's no author there. It's automated. They're retweeting only other authors that have bought their little vanity publishing service. And no books are sold, but it doesn't matter because the point is to sell a package to the author, not to sell any books. So it doesn't matter that those 100 retweets didn't sell a single copy of a book. It doesn't matter that uh, it doesn't. none of the bot stuff matters because... The author is the customer, not readers, okay? So book tasters, authors, let me find them. I might just show them, uh, see if I can find them. Let's see here. If I haven't blocked them, I think I, uh, yeah, yeah. So I think I block most of these guys because they are scams. But I think um, I haven't blocked this one. Okay, let me show you. There's a couple clues here. I'll give you a couple of clues. Let me let me pull this up here. Um, okay, let's find Twitter. AKA X. I like saying Twitter more than X though, but X sounds better when you stop and think about it. I think X sounds better. Okay. All right, here it is. Okay. So you look at it. Let's look at the follower ratio. Okay. 66.4 thousand followers, 41.3 thousand following. No one can interact with 41,000 followers. No one, no one can follow 41,000 people and actually see anything from them, right? If you, have, if you are following 41,000 people, you are following nobody. Does that make sense? So we look here, what they do is they say, we have 60,000 followers, 66. You pay us hundreds of dollars and we'll tweet your book out to our 66,000 followers. Those followers are just people that they followed with a bot. And then those people just haven't, you know, they followed back. They don't interact with you. And you can look at it with their tweets, right? So, um, you know, when you just tweet art, you can get it. But like, let's see if he has like a, a link, right? You know, um, or like, what's another one? Book tasters. Book tasters authors will follow me constantly. Thirty-one thousand. See so those even numbers. That that means that it's that this is not a real account with real people. Watch your thoughts; they become words. Nine for thirty-three thousand followers, you're getting nine likes. Great. This pinned one, which has a lot of likes to it, um, right? Reviewing services like they sell fake reviews, probably too. Okay. Drink your coffee. You know, you'll 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 repost something that you've reposted before, or that gets engagement. Um, you're reposting the things from the other account, right? Tweeting out a link to a book for three hundred dollars as a promotional promotional service. If there's even followers, this this big account following you that has thirty one thousand followers will never retweet you, right? You are never getting engagement or promotion out of this at all. You're there to make this number bigger so that they can sell a service to an author. That's why that's why you exist. Okay. If you're following any of this stuff, you should probably block it. Um, but yeah, another one that I think of is like Calame Editions. That's what they do. They they sell you an author package that includes them making an automated Twitter account for you and pretending that like that's gonna sell books. Um, Lulu is a printer. Alois, what is Lulu books? Lulu is a printer. So they will print your books. You can hire them to print books. Um, Kirsova magazine is printed by Lulu now because uh, he made the owner of Ingram Spark cry, uh, which is a whole nother story. But yeah, so there's they're a printer. And so if you are doing like a crowdfund, which is something else I should talk about. 
So I want to caution people. Anyway, I want to caution people away from vanity publishing. If there's a company that says we're going to, we are looking for authors to publish and we will publish you and we're a hybrid. That's, that's all vanity publishing steer clear. If you are going to be putting, if you're going to be using your money, then just self publish it by yourself. I have videos on how to do it. Trust me. It's going to be worth the time because you can do it for more books. It's like, how do I self publish? Here's a, me looking at me, looking at you, looking at me, looking at you. What am I doing here? Let's just have me. <laughs> okay. Doesn't Lulu have better print quality than Amazon? It depends. In my experience, not really. It's like the same. Um, Lulu will damage less books, apparently, than Ingram Spark will. And you can do different things with Lulu that may be better. So Lulu might be a really good printer if you're looking at doing graphic novels or something else that is more image intensive. Um, if you're doing black and white images in your book, they need to be formatted in a certain way that I don't have time to talk about now, but I've talked about it in other videos, right? If you have like black and white illustrations, like, I don't know if you guys can see that black and white illustration. It has to be formatted a certain way to come out like really crisp in a book. Um, basically, you have to not have grays. It has to be black and no grays. And instead of grays, you actually want um, half tones, which is like dots. Uh, printers do half tones automatically, but if you are trying to print grays with like Amazon print on demand service, you, you can end up with a really washed out look. That's all. It doesn't look that bad, but like it looks kind of washed out and you can actually see the, you can see the, the half tones there. So that's what Lulu is. They're pretty good, right? Um, most of my friends that have used them say that, uh, you know, Lulu is good. And generally the books come printed, printed on time, printed well, not damaged product, not product that you have to send back because it's been printed incorrectly, it's generally pretty high quality. I think there may be a listing of literary agents in your local library. There used to be a catalog of music agents and stuff, um, talent agents that you could find at libraries, but I don't know of that now. The way that most authors I know of who have found agents is by querying agents that rep authors that are in a similar place to them. So if you write a book that is like Harry Dresden type books, then you would want to get uh, Jim Butcher's off, uh, agent. You would want to at least query him. Then you want to find a lot of other authors that are maybe similar and then query those agents. Joe Abercrombie's agent, right? All the way down the list, mid-list authors, bottom shit tier list authors. You just, you keep querying. There's no reason to not query a great agent, an agent who repped a big author just because you're new, because Jim Butcher was new at one point too, right? The thing that worries me about KDP is people have gotten their accounts suspended or worse due to false positives. Aggregators apparently do this less, less often. I've heard this as well. I don't, I've not gotten anything taken off of Amazon. I've never gotten suspended from Amazon. And I do know some of the people that cry foul about Amazon are actually crying foul about being caught doing something such as using Chinese click farmers to click through their uh, KDP select books and rank them up for them. Or they pay for a promotional service not knowing what it is and it's a click farm and then their, then their account gets suspended. I knew someone that that happened to. It was it just it ended his career. Like he just had to walk away from doing books. Uh, after that happened, I think he never published another book. I think he just walked away from the business, which really sucks. But, you know, when you have to start again from ground zero to build up all of the, especially the social proof of reviews, um, having to do that all again from, from like square one, ground zero is really, uh, it'll just, what's the word, like despair? It'll put you in despair. You just like, okay, I'm just done. It's like if I got the YouTube channel banned, you know. I'll probably just be done doing YouTube. That's all. Like starting with two subscribers and doing the same thing again. I don't need to do that. 
Only publishers like Penguin Random House are vertically integrated owner printers. Even then, I think that they outsource a lot of theirs, though, right? They might they might do a lot of printing themselves. Um, just as an example, I have one right here. Who published this one? This is a print-on-demand book, guys. This Robert E. Howard book is print-on-demand. And I've gone over this before. Who printed this? Copyright Cole Productions. This is a Delray trade paperback. This is printed by Ingram Spark, I'm pretty sure. It's whoever does Amazon stuff. It's the exact same formatting, exact same print quality. Everything on it's exactly it's the exact same size. It even has the it even has like the same little like bins in the yeah, it's a print on demand book. There's a lot of big publishers that still use print on demand because if you're going to make a run of books and you know you're not certain about how many you're going to sell or you think it's going to be low volume, but like it's something that you just have the rights to or could easily do like Cole, um, and or it's a reprint, you just do a print on demand and, and you don't have to ever do uh, invest a lot of money in a reprint and then hopefully make your money back over time. You just If it's not selling a lot or it's a low volume book, you just have it as print on demand. You use the same kind of sales channels as everybody else and it works. Um, Wattpad started with fanfic. That's right. Yeah, classic authors wrote serially. Now this is true. Um, so, you know, Charles Dickens wrote serially. Lots of people wrote serially. But serial fiction was a different thing in the 19th century. Newspapers published serial fiction. People bought lots of magazines and they read them. There was serial fiction in literary magazines in the 20th century. Weird tales and astounding science fiction and all that kind of stuff. Why did that go away? Well, it just went away because a lot of those venues for that to exist went away. People buying constantly new issues of literary magazines or newspapers. I don't own a newspaper subscription and I actually don't know anyone who does. So why would they print uh, serial fiction in that? I don't have a single magazine subscription. And I think the only person I know of who has a magazine subscription is my mom. And it's like Better Homes and Gardens. It's not a literary magazine. So a lot of the venues for serial fiction disappeared. The internet, though, could totally has those opportunities. And it's if you're starting out, the optionality is probably to at least try it. Because uh, the worst that can happen is no one reads your book. And then you publish it as a regular book anyway. No big deals. I think Dickens wrote, was it the Pitwick Papers? One of Dickens's books was written entirely serially. Um, and then there's a lot of classic fantasy and science fiction books that were written um, kind of one piece at a time in the literary magazines. Uh, the Gunslinger by Stephen King was written in as four or five separate story inst installments um, in a magazine. And that was, and then he published it as a whole book in 1978. Um, so yeah, great stream. Thank you. Mystery title and Comic Sans. I've heard Comic Sans is easier to read. Just as a weird thing. Someone's like, yeah, you got to try reading in Comic Sans. You'll never miss a word. And then I tried it and I could. And I'm like, but it feels so stupid. It feels so stupid to read in Comic Sans. <laughs> Al Gore is super duper serial. All right. It's 810. I probably need to call it and have dinner. I've been gone all day. Went and took my... Son to the doctor and my wife to a, a doctor down in Houston. And we went to the museum, saw some mummies. I haven't had a real meal all day. So I, I need to probably call it and go have a real meal. And then I'll do, uh, I'll do a, I'll do another live write. Hopefully later in the week, get this, uh, get this little story that I've been doing live on the air finished up. And then, uh, I'll demonstrate how to publish it. I'll demonstrate all the stuff that I'm talking about here now. Um, last thing I'll talk about is crowdfunds. I don't usually do them. Some people do them. What do you need to do to do a crowdfund? I'll give you basic advice. You need to have a, a, an audience already. So you need to have people who already know who you are and are interested in buying a product from you. So you need to build an audience. So before you do crowdfunding comes audience building. If you start off with crowdfunding and you're a nobody and this is your first book, no one will fund your book. They have to have a reason to do it. They have to know you. 
So you have to have a social media following. You have to be playing in a Swedish melodic death metal band. <laughs> Whatever it is. You have to have that going on before you do a crowdfund. Crowdfund is basically this. You have it on Indiegogo or Kickstarter or something. You have a couple of monetary goals. You have several packages people can buy into, like I'm buying the ebook, I'm buying the physical copy, I'm buying a signed physical copy. Those are th three really easy tiers for a book. An ebook, a uh, paperback, a hardback, because you can do paperbacks and hard hardbacks print on demand through Lulu or Amazon, uh, signed hardback. And you can come up with other stuff too, like signed art or something. Or I'll hire an artist to do interior illustrations as a stretch goal, right? Then you have goals, like my goal is to fund this at $1,000. You wanna set your goals fairly low, goals that you think you can meet. So if a goal is $1,000, that's a big number, but keep in mind that you're gonna be using portions of those orders to buy physical copies and sell them. Sorry, let me say it's $1,000 and you feel like you can meet $1,000, you have a nice, big audience to do it. Um, you sell those packages, you have stretch goals. If we get to 2000, I'll hire an illustrator to do 10 illustrations for the interior of the book. If we get to 3000, this, and you can have regular goals, like at $1,000, they'll pay for the cover and editing. $2,000 interior illustrations, $3,000 and this. Brian Niemeyer has some really cool tiers in his book where like you could pay $250 and you get to get killed in the book. Like there's a character that's you or named after you and they get to die in the book. That is a cool tier, right? You can come up with really fun, creative things like that. That people, I'll pay $250 to have you kill me in the book, right? Have you kill me in the book, right? So that's cool. That's how you do a crowdfund. When, once you get it funded, then you have to deliver the product. So you will through the crowdfunding website, get people's addresses. You have to box up the books and ship them, which means you have to print them. You have to have enough lag time, usually a couple months, to print all the books, get them to you, package them up, mail them to people, and then you fulfilled it. And then you can email out the the uh, uh, ebook, right? Or do the ebook through like BookFunnel or something else, right? There's many ways to distribute ebooks. It's really easy. You can do a uh, book funnel to freely distribute ebooks as long as they're low volume. I actually have a paid book funnel account because I use it for like a lot of books and to distribute a lot of books through like Patreon and stuff like that in the past and also like for other other projects. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I've used book funnel for a lot of stuff. We don't need to get deep into that. Most authors don't need to worry about that kind of stuff now. That's more promotional kind of things. Anyway, you do the crowdfund and then after you're done with the crowdfund, you can always still put the book on Amazon and sell to people who weren't around for the crowdfund. And that's what I recommend you do, okay? So the crowdfund is good because it gives you a nice lump sum at, towards the beginning of a project to, to pay for things or to quickly recoup expenses. Generally, you're gonna wanna already have a cover to do a crowdfund, which means you're gonna have to eat the cost of a cover no matter what. And then other things you could pay for later if you want to hire an interior illustrator, interior designer, um, you want to hire someone to do something else, editor, whatever it's going to be. Um, so that'll that'll pay for all the other expenses that you incur along the way. Okay. Anyway, I think that's going to be it for today. I think I covered most of the basic publishing stuff. Um, yeah, and like if you're crowdfunding, Generally, you're gonna to wanna to pick a printer to do your crowdfund. Um, some people actually hire like fulfillment services to do this, but there's more money in having Lulu print out the books. You know exactly how many books you need because you crowdfunded them. There's 50 people who need physical copies of the book. You print 60, so you have 10 extra maybe. You print that number of books and mail them, mail them out, sign them, whatever it is. It's great. I don't buy into a lot of crowd funds, and here's why. People are really bad at fulfilling their, their crowd funds. Um, they're really bad at it. And the comic, the independent comic crowd is probably the worst in this regard. I saw another indie indie comic finally got fulfilled after two year, two years after being funded. 
And it wasn't even like a complete story. It's like, they're going to fund book two. No one's going to buy it. If you don't fulfill your books on time, you're not going to get a lot of repeat customers. So you need to have a fulfillment goal that you can actually manage. What tends to happen is they crowdfund comics and then they're terrible at, at doing work. And so they never do the work and the book comes out a year or two years late. There's so many comic artists that do it. I can tell you a few that don't, and I've had them on the show. Matt Krotz, John De La Rose, um, they do their stuff on time. Uh, Yakov Merkin, who's a novelist, he does his stuff on time. Brian Niemeyer does his stuff on time. So if you go buy their crowdfunded stuff, you're going to get your book and it's not going to take that long. J.D. Cowan does his stuff on time. Okay. Uh, Kirsova, well, you'll get, if you crowdfund with the Kirsova uh, issue or one of the, the other publications uh, that go under that name, then you're going to probably get your book on time. They don't have massive delays. Uh, when they do have a delay, it's like it's a week, right? It's not two years. So I'm very leery of crowdfunding at this point. That's why you need to have that audience relationship because audiences. Once you, once you burn a reader, it's really hard to bring them back into the fold. Once a reader gets burned by crowdfunding in an area, they're not going to want to con contribute to it later. If they if they kickstarted Cyberfrog and Cyberfrog came in two years late and it was garbage, they're never they're going to like never crowdfund another comic again. <laughs> they're just like, no, nah, all these indie comic creators are bullshit. I'm never giving them a, a dollar. If if the if the book is live, maybe I'll buy it, but I'm not I'm not doing a crowdfund, you know. <laughs> Some YouTuber apparently paid $50,000 to have him inserted in some animation where he got hit on by some character from Has Been Hotel. I'm, a, I'm addicted to crowdfunding board games. I love it. I have crowd, I crowdfunded um, Hero Quest, the new Hero Quest. I'll admit I did that because I love the old Hero Quest. And my son and I have had a ton of time playing it. But even then, it took like over a year for that to get delivered. And that, that kind of lag sucks. I don't like that kind of lag on stuff. A thrilling read. I couldn't put it down. Stephen King. <laughs> it's a, a, a thrilling read. I couldn't put it down. The book is the, the, the book is called This Book is Covered in Glue. <laughs> now my hands are stuck. This is a thrilling read. I can't put it down and I'm really worried about it. <laughs> Thanks much, Lee Overlook Pictures. Thank you for watching on Twitter. On X. I don't think anyone watches this shit on Twitch. I haven't promoted or like dealt with my Twitch channel until like recently after like letting it lay dead for years because I just don't like Twitch at all. Um, so <laughs> I don't think anyone watches on Twitch. I heard Twitch is basically dying anyway, which maybe that sucks. Whatever. You know. Yeah, the... The new Hero Quest is pretty good. It's listed as 14 plus, which is dumb. My eight-year-old plays it just fine. I don't know why it's 14 plus. I think it's because people die. Okay, let me give some links before I go, and then I think that's going to be it if I can find my links. All right, so make sure you are heading over to the No Talkie Talkie channel. The No Talkie Talkie channel just has stuff like ambient music on it. So you could subscribe to that. Make sure you are subscribed to the regular channel. I'm going to link both these. I'm not sure which one's the regular channel. Make sure you're on the mailing list. dbspress.com slash list or free dash book. And you get a free book. I think it's uh, Demon X Machina still. I haven't come up with a new free book for this year, but I'm, I'll probably rotate that. And you can, of course, head over to my coffee, Ko-Fi. I was going Ko-Fi, but is it coffee? You tell me. Or my Patreon. Where's the Patreon? There it is. Those are the links. All right. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I really, really do appreciate it. And um, all your questions and comments on this kind of stuff. Um. And I, and I really hope that everybody will have success with this and be able to use this information. If you want more information, you can just email me 
stu at dbspress.com and I'll either point you to the right video that I've already talked about an issue or uh, just give you as best an answer as I can. It's not legal advice, but it's um, advice based on my experiences. I don't know everything about every little detail, but uh, chances are somebody out there does. And so you can probably find somebody who's willing to answer your questions. Most people are pretty happy to help others out. I know I am. So have a great one and I will see you all next time.